Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar series presented by the International Adsorption Society. The IAS is an international organization dedicated to advancing adsorption as a solution to scientific, engineering, and human welfare challenges through the promotion of adsorption research and education. We hope that all of our attendees and their families, including their colleagues, are safe amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We thank everyone for attending the webinar today. The webinar series um, started in the spring of 2020, and we restarted it last autumn, and it has been an immense success, and the recordings of these webinars continue to be viewed on YouTube. We plan to continue these webinars through the present academic year with a variety of speakers from industry, academia, and other research institutes, as well as PhD students and early career researchers. Subsequent webinars will be announced on the IAS mailing list and the IAS Twitter feed. Today's webinar will be a two-part presentation by Dr. Swang Kyang uh, Nguyen and uh, Dan Sidarius from uh, NIST in the United States. Uh, I'm Arvind Rajendran, a professor at the University of Alberta. Today's webinar will be moderated by Juliana Coelho uh, from uh, the Federal University of Serra, Fortaleza, Brazil. We are required to remind attendees and future viewers that the views expressed by the speaker, host, or other moderators are not necessarily those of IAS or the institutions associated with these individuals. We ask that you consider joining the IAS as a regular member if you're not already. Our dues are minimal, only 20 US dollars per year, but support the publication of our flagship journal, its option, contribute to travel grants and workshops, seed funding for IAS members, and affiliated groups, as well as aid the organization of our triennial conference on the fundamentals of its option. Members also receive free access to IAS supported materials, including our journal, as well as the adsorption database published by Springer Materials. Anyone can follow IAS on Twitter at uh, intadsos for future updates regarding IAS events, webinars, and information about scientific meetings. Please do expand our YouTube channel by subscribing. The International Conference on the Fundamentals of Adsorption is the premier conference in the field of liquid and gas adsorption, attended by the world's leading scientists and engineers from academia, government, and industry. The 14th edition will be held in Broomfield, Colorado, USA, between 22nd and 27th of May, 2022. Do visit the website and learn more. Now I will pass uh, uh, the proceedings to Juliana. Juliana, please. Okay. Our first speaker is Dr. Juan Jian Yen. She's a research chemist at the Facility for Absorption Characterization and Testing, Fact Lab, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, USA. She received her PhD from Northwestern University, USA and was an NRC postdoctoral fellow at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, USA. She is the chair of VAMAS TWA 39 solid sorbents since 2000, 2019. Her research interests include reference materials, reference adsorption data, adsorption measurements, graph metric adsorption techniques, binary and multi-component adsorption. During the webinar, questions can be submitted to the speaker via the Q&A tab of the Zoom or as comments on YouTube. Those comments will be forwarded to the Zoom hosts. Questions for Dr. Nguyen will be addressed at the end of their segment and then again at the end of the webinar. Yang, you can go ahead and share your screen, please. Hey, one second. And you can turn on your camera as well. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Juliana, for the introduction. And I want to thank the organizers, so Dan and Arvind, for um, having me here this morning. Uh, to give this talk. Um, so today I will talk about reference high pressure absorption isotherms. 
Um, these are the results of international interlaboratory studies um, that was led by NIST. Um, and I want to start off with the acknowledgements. Um, there are many uh, laboratories that were involved in the study. So we have 11 labs um, in our CO2 studies and 20 labs in the methane studies. Um, so in total, 26 um, researchers were involved in the CO2 study and 46 researchers were involved in the methane study. Um, so I want to acknowledge all of them here um, on this first slide. Um, I also want to acknowledge our funding um, from RPE. Um, so that was used to support um, the construction of the lab, as well as VAMAS, um, through which we organized the methane um, study. Uh, so um, probably most in the audience uh, know about solid absorbent materials. Uh, so these materials are useful in many different applications uh, due to the absorption or the adhesions of uh, fluid to their surface. So the fluid uh, is gas or vapor. Um, so just give me one second. I'm going to change uh, the pointer so it's easier. So the uh, sorbent can take the form of powders. Um, they could be pellets or they can be made into membranes. And some of the applications uh, include carbon dioxide capture, um, storage of fuel, so like methane or hydrogen, um, gas purification, as well as catalysis. Um, so to determine the, um, the storage or separation capability of a sorbent material, uh, you would typically look at a sorption isotherm, which is a plot of gas or vapor uptake at different equilibrium pressure. Um, at a constant temperature. So an isotherm will typically look like this. Um, and there are two different uh, measurement principles to determine the, the gas uptake. Um, so the first is the metametric, um, also known as the volumetric method. So that typically looks at the change in um, pressure of the absorptive or the free gas um, to determine the amount of gas absorbed. And the second method is the gravimetric method, which looks at the change in the mass of the absorbent um, as absorption takes place. So just briefly, uh, I want to go into the absorption techniques. So for the gravimetric uh, technique, uh, you typically have rely on a uh, microbalance. Um, and here you see that um, you typically would tear your, your balance before you load your sample. Um, and initially, um, because the system is normally under vacuum, uh, your actual mass or your, is equal to your measure mass, which is uh, typically the measure, the mass of the, um, the activated sample. Um, on the right here, um, the gas is allowed to enter the system um, and your measure mass will increase um, due to the absorption. Um, so the mass of the, uh, the absorbed mass here. Um, however, because um, the, the gas at high pressure acts as uh, basically like a fluid. So you, we have this counteracting force, which is the buoyancy force, uh, which goes up um, in opposition to the mass of your sample and the absorbed mass. So your measure mass um, is actually the actual mass minus um, the buoyancy component. So the buoyancy force is equal to the volume of gas that's displaced by the various balance components. So in this case, um, this hanging out wire, the sample holder, um, the sample, um, times the density of the gas, times the acceleration due to gravity. So here I just cancel and cancel out all the, the G, the acceleration due to gravity. So you can re, uh, rearrange this to solve for the actual mass. So that's equal to your measure mass um, plus the buoyancy component, which is equal to the mass of the sample plus the mass absorbed. And then we can solve for the mass absorbed by taking the difference between the final actual mass minus the initial actual mass over here. So here we are looking at excess absorption. Um, so you notice that the V here, um, we're not taking into account the volume of the absorbed phase. So we're not looking at absolute absorption, we're looking at excess absorption. Um, in the manometric system, you typically have a reference chamber and then you have a sample chamber, um, you have pressure transducer, thermocouple. Um, so initially you would dose um, a known amount of gas into the reference chamber. Uh, the moles of gas could be calculated from this equation here. So N is equal to the pressure times the volume of the reference chamber divided by the compressibility factor times the gas constant times the temperature. Um, the gas is then allowed to expand into your sam uh, sample chamber here. Um, so the pressure will drop to P prime. 
Um, so the moles of gas, of free gas, is now equal to P prime times the void volume, which in this case would be the reference uh, chamber volume plus the, the sample chamber volume minus the volume of the sample over Z prime times R times T. Um, since the mole of gas is conserved, um, you can determine the amount of gas absorbed by um, from here. So you can rearrange the equations to solve for the moles of gas absorbed. Again, this is excess absorption uh, because we are not taking into account the volume of the absorbed base um, and for the volume factor here. So there has been substantial investment into absorptive materials. Um, however, there's notable uh, reproducibility issues in absorption isotherm measurements, uh, particularly at high pressure. Um, so this is due to lack of reference materials and data. Um, so I have two examples from the literature um, shown here. Um, these are both um, interlaboratory studies. So the first is hydrogen absorption on a microporous carbon at 77 Kevin. And you can see that the isotherms are basically all over the place. Um, and on the right, we have um, carbon on shell um, at 338 Kevin. Again, the isotherms are just basically all over the place. So there really is a need to develop um, standard materials as well as um, reference data. So the FAC lab was um, created um, for this purpose. So um, our lab is equipped with uh, various instrumentations, um, mostly commercial, to do um, single gas uh, measurements as well as um, binary gas measurements. So we have both the manometric and gravimetric methods. Uh, we can also do pore size character characterization and surface area measurements um, and pressure at various, um, various, various range of pressure as well as various different temperatures. Um, so a while back, we held a workshop on measurement needs in the absorption sciences. And the workshop helped to identify um, some key um, areas and standard needs in the absorption sciences. And basically, it was recommended that NIST um, whole interlaboratory studies to generate reference isotherm and that we develop a reference database, um, which Dan will talk about um, in his talk after money. So the objectives of the interlaboratory study um, is to assess the comparability of high pressure absorption measurements um, to basically generate high pressure absorption isotherm um, and to provide um, best practices for the measurements at high pressure. So in consultation with the International Absorption Society, uh, we basically came up with this table with um, gases of interest um, that we could do to study with. So um, we have uh, carbon dioxide. Um, so obviously looking at CO2 capture, methane and hydrogen for storage, uh, sulfur hexafluoride for capture, argon for material characterization, and water for material stability. Um, here are some recommended materials that we could use for these studies. Um, so you can see from this table that um, when our lab was created, there really was only um, reference material for one gas, which is argon um, here. So for our first um, interlaboratory study, or IOS, uh, we looked at CO2 and ZSM-5. So we chose this reference material, 8052, which is um, ZSM-5, uh, because it's an existing uh, NIST reference material. So that means it's homogenized, it's well characterized, for uh, various uh, different um, physiochemical properties. So we don't have to worry about the material. Um, it's mostly microporous um, and it's the least hydroscopic of the existing NIST reference zeolites. Um, you can find more information on it in this paper here. Um, so we chose CO2 as the absorptive. Obviously, um, most labs are equipped to handle CO2 and it's also relevant for you know, sequestration, um, storage and separation, so climate change. Um, there were a range of measurement platforms used in the study. We have metametric, gravimetric, um, commercial, as well as custom design instrumentations. Um, in this lab um, of this study, um, we invited participants. So um, we invited those that we felt had expertise in high pressure absorption uh, metrology. Um, so we were able to get um, you know, a couple of instrument manufacturers to uh, join the study as well as colleagues from um, academia to participate in the study. Um, and we did critical evaluation of the data set using statistical metrics as well as expert review. 
So for the protocol, we kept it quite general because we wanted um, the participants to be able to do what they normally would do for a high pressure measurement. Uh, we only specified that the purity of the CO2 be 99.99% or better um, to activate the sample at 350 degrees Celsius for 12 hour under high vacuum. So using a turbo molecular pump and that the pressure range be up to 4.5 megapascal, temperature is at 20 Celsius. And to do two isotherms on two separate aliquots, so for a total of like four isotherms to form one data set. Um, so 11 labs um, submitted data. We had 13 data sets in total um, using 14 instruments. Um, there were seven metric instruments and seven gravimetric instruments. For the processing steps, um, the participating labs uh, submit the data set. Um, they were then critically evaluated. And what's um, unique about this study is that we allow the participants to uh, remeasure or reprocess their data. Um, and then we have um, the final submitted data set that we use to extract the reference isotherm. So here are some um, examples of data sets um, that were submitted. So uh, the majority of the lab actually have pretty good um, repeatability uh, within their lab. So you can see here that you know the four isotherms from these data sets are uh, pretty repeatable. Um, there was uh, one or two labs where um, the repeatability was not great. Um, however, we do see differences in shape, you know, and uptake. Um, so here is the compilations of the 13 data sets. Um, what's shown are um, averages of the four isotherms for each of the data set. Um, so we can see a cluster of isotherms um, that you know, have really good agreement to each other. And then uh, one that's a little bit high and then a couple that's a little bit low. And then, you know, one isotherm with a shape that's, uh, you know, a little bit different. So um, with critical evaluation using statistical metrics and expert review, uh, we were able to identify six data sets for reconsideration. Um, so two, four, eight, 11, 12, and 13. Um, and some of the issues, um, the potential problems um, after you know, talking with the participant and going over the experimental procedures that they use, um, we thought maybe um, there may be a mass issue uh, with, with this measurement here. Um, a couple of them didn't do blank subtractions. Um, this one didn't do buoyancy correction. Um, this one potentially didn't activate the sample completely. Um, and there might be issue with human absorption and the buoyancy measurement. So um, the issues addressed. Um, this table shows what the the six participant did to modify or resubmit their data set. So uh, data set two uh, applied blank correction to the isotherm. Um, data set four um, uh, corrected the low pressure isotherm that they used to normalize their high pressure data. So that um, was able to correct for the, the sample mass. Um, and then data set eight was not resubmitted. Um, 11 did buoyancy correction, uh, fixed the skeletal density and did blank correction. Um, data set 12 followed the activation protocol. Um, I believe they activate a little bit lower when they submitted initially. And then data set 13 um, did buoyancy correction um, or measurements at a higher elevated temperature to um, prevent heat absorption and then did blank correction. So shown here are just two examples of before and after. So you can see with data set two um, that the shape of the isotherm is significantly improved after applying the blank correction. Um, and then for data set 11, the uptake, um, it's definitely improved with uh, applying the, blank, uh, the buoyancy correction and the blank subtraction. So here is the, um, the, the data set plus the resubmitted data set. So you can see that the agreement um, among the, uh, the the 12 data sets are um, a lot better now. So we, we took out number eight because it wasn't resubmitted. Um, and then we were able to uh, obtain the reference isotherm along with the confidence interval using a Bayesian Markov chain Monte Carlo method. Um, and that was captured by this four parameter logistic function. So uh, I want to mention that the logistic function was just um, chosen because it um, it captures the shape of the isotherm well. There's no physical significance to it. Um, it was something we found from a, a function book. Um, so there should be no physical significance associated with it or the parameters. Um, and all the statistical work was done by our statistician, um, Blasa. 
Uh, so this is uh, one of the very first um, high pressure reference uh, isotherm for, from the reference material um, ever published. So to obtain the reference um, isotherm, we gave some recommendations um, for the measurements. So on sample activation, it's really important. So um, you should follow the activation protocol. So um, 350, 12 hour in a high vacuum. And if the sample is activated ex situ, um, should avoid exposure to air. Um, so you don't get you know, moisture um, taking up with the sample again. Um, sample volume determination um, should be done um, properly because it's important for both the buoyancy correction uh, for gravimetric system as well as void volume and a metric system. We provided a scale of density for the material um, in case it's needed for some of the instrumentations. Um, buoyancy correction and void volume correction um, obviously should be applied. Um, so we saw some data that didn't apply them and that you know could detriment, detrimentally affect the data. Um, the equation of state should, uh, you should use um, the proper equation of state. So for CO2 at 20 degrees Celsius, um, we recommend this being Wagner equation of state. Um, this one's pretty obvious, but temperature, pressure, and mass need to be uh, well controlled and measured. Um, they're all, they all play into the measurements. So they need to uh, you need really to ensure that they are uh, measured accurately. Um, and we highly recommend a blank correction. Um, so this should be performed whenever possible. Um, it corrects for like, you know, any background um, systematic issue that you may have and you may not be aware of. So um, for our second study, we looked at um, methane and zeolite Y. Uh, we chose misreference material 8850 um, as the absorbent. Again, it's one of the misreference zeolites. So it's um, already homogenized and well characterized for a lot of the um, physiochemical properties. Um, this one's completely microporous and it's a little bit more hydroscopic than um, the ZSM-5 that we used in the previous study. Uh, we chose methane as the absorptive. Um, we, again, many labs are equipped to handle it and it's also relevant to you know, energy storage and transport. Um, there were, again, manometric as well as gravimetric commercial and custom built uh, instruments. The study is different than the first study in that anyone could participate. So um, we had a lot of new participants in addition to um, some participants in the old study. Um, and we also did um, critical evaluation of the data set with statistical metrics and expert review. Uh, so because anyone could participate, uh, we wanted the participant to demonstrate their measurement capability by replicating the CO2 ZSM reference isotherm from the previous study. The sample, uh, we provided sample and measurement protocol um, to activate the sample at 350 for 12 hour and high vacuum um, and to do the measurements up on, on zeolite Y with methane up to uh, 7.5 megapascal at 25 degrees Celsius. Um, so this one is super critical. Um, and then measurements are made in two aliquots and two plates. So again, four isotherm um, for one data set. So in total, we had 20 labs that submitted data. Um, we had 17 new CO2 data sets and then 28 um, methane data sets. Um, so obviously some of the labs submitted multiple data sets. Um, for our processing step, um, participants submit the data set. We do critical evaluation. And um, they are allowed to re-measure, reprocess if they, uh, their data is an uh, outlier. Um, however, for this study, um, the fact lab did not interact with the participant to determine the cause. Um, and the final data was used to extract the reference isotherm. Um, so objectives, um, obviously, to generate a reference isotherm from the data and also to evaluate um, the usefulness of the CO2 CSM reference data. So this is um, the CO2 um, data from the new participants. So we got 17 data sets in total. Um, so we can see here that you know, the majority of the data are pretty good and um, within the bounds. Um, it's easier to look at the residuals, which is basically just the difference between the measure uptake minus the reference uptake. Um, so you can see that you know, these two, uh, this data set in the blue, um, and the yellow are clearly outside of the bounds. Um, 
However, in cases um, such as this pink one or this green one, it's a little bit harder to tell just by looking at the residual because um, you know, the majority of the data could be inside the bounds, but then they have one data point that's out. Um, so we also look at what's called a goodness of fit value, which um, is kind of like the residual, but it averages across the, the pressure range. And um, it also takes into account the uncertainties um, so it gives you sort of a number value that's easier to, um, to evaluate the data sets um, and see how good they are at replicating the CO2 isotherm. Um, so based on the good a fit value, um, we basically assign anything under 0 0.07 um, as passing, and then those under 0 0.12 as um, you know, borderline, and then anything above it will be failing. So based on that, there were four data sets that fell, um, seven data sets passed, and then six data sets were um, categorized as borderline in the CO2 proficiency test. Um, so everyone was allowed to submit methane data, um, although not all the data would be used in the reference isotherm. Um, so we see here there are 18 data sets from the participants, um, and then we have 10 from the participant from the previous ILS. Um, so we do see a good cluster of data um, around here. Um, and then we see, you know, a couple of data sets that are kind of way off um, in some of the regions. Um, so the CO2 proficiency test was able to um, identify five out-of-spec measurements. So basically anyone who fell the CO2 proficiency test also uh, were considered outliers based on our statistical analysis. Um, so there's five here instead of four as in the previous slide, because um, one participant actually uh, submitted methane, but did not submit CO2 data. So they basically automatically fell and they were also identified as an outlier from our statistical um, analysis. And then we were able to identify two other submissions that were outliers, so totaling seven data sets. Um, one of the other outlier was a participant in the previous study, but they had changed instrumentation uh, in coming into the new study. So they ran into issues that they didn't have um, in the previous study. Um, so with the remaining data sets, uh, we um, applied this uh, five parameter uh, reference function to, um, to obtain the reference isotherm. And again, this has no physical significance. Um, it's just a function that captures the isotherm well. Um, and so here is our final um, methane z like y reference isotherm data. So all the study uh, data on reference isotherm are available in the NIST's Russian database. Um, so I believe Dan will talk a little bit about, about that next. Um, our reference z lights are available from NIST. Um, they're for sale for um, $432 for 40 grams. Um, we added the reference data to the appendix of the report of investigation for these, uh, these reference um, zeolites. Um, and for additional information, go on to our website. Um, so to summarize, um, for the CO2 CSM5 study, um, we conducted an international interlocutory study uh, looking at high pressure uh, isotherm. We reported the first ever high pressure reference isotherm using a reference material. Uh, we provided guidance to obtain the reference isotherm. Um, all the data is available at the absorption um, database. And for complete details, you could look at our publication at absorption. Um, for the methane study, we demonstrated the usefulness of the CO2 ZSM5 reference isotherm to evaluate the performance of high pressure absorption measurements. Uh, we provided reference. Um, methane, the light Y isotherm. Um, again, all the data is available in the absorption database and complete details can be found in our paper um, just published uh, late last year. Um, and for future work, uh, we are looking into uh, water absorption. So providing um, reference data for water absorption. Um, so for some readings from our lab, so obviously the two papers on the reference data that I just talked about, um, we've also, a few years ago, we did a, um, a measurement best practice um, with the gravimetric technique, um, looking at buoyancy correction in particular, um, also length subtraction and temperature gradients uh, in your system. Um, and there was a, little, uh, a short paper on um, healing technometry measurement best practices. Um, so discussed, uh, it talked about um, you know, sample volume, temperature control, and sample activation, and how that affects um, the data. 
Um, for general reading, um, I really like these two books. Um, so this Absorption by Powders and Poor Solid Principle Methodology and Application by Ruckerl and Ruckerl. Um, and then Gas Absorption Equilibria, Experimental Methods and Absorption Isotherms by Keller and Stout. So this one's particularly useful if you, um, if you like instrumentations or looking into the methodology. Um, and this one has a lot of good fundamental and applications. So thank you um, for your attention and I will be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Yang, for the presentation. We have one question to Gian from David Danach. Did you see any common trends in isotherm, de isotherm deviation? Example, manometric measurements have greater devi deviation from the reference at high pressures. Yep. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Did you see any common trends in isotherm deviation? Example, manometric measurements have greater deviation from the reference at higher pressure. I mean, I wouldn't say it's common trend. Um, we do notice um, slightly greater deviation with the manometric system. Um, however, we don't we think that both the manometric and gravimetric system are capable of doing measurements accurately um, if done correctly. Um, but yeah, we did see um, you know, slightly more manometric system that were outliers, but that doesn't mean that you can't do the measurement accurately with the manometric system. But I wouldn't say it's like common trends because they all have like slightly different issues. Okay, thank you. Another question. Are the uptakes of the reference isotherms absolute or excess? So um, everything I show are excess. Another question. Did you also check the BHT surface area and pore size before and after the adsorption? The surface. Yes. Um, so we did we did report it in the paper, but we, we definitely looked at the X-ray pattern of the material um, and we did we did check um, the surface area for the the, the Z lights are really stable. Um, you can probably recycle them many, many times and still get the same answer. Okay, I think we uh, probably there'll be more questions coming up. So we'll probably move on to dance talk and then we'll come back. Okay. Yep. So let me share my screen. Juliana, over to you. Okay. Our next speaker, Dr. Daniel Sideros, is a research engineer in the Chemical Informatics Research Group at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. He received his PhD in chemical engineering from Purdue University. He was a postdoc at Washington University in St. Louis and at NIST before joining the permanent technical staff of NIST. His main research interests are in the thermodynamics of confining fluids using molecular simulation and statistical mechanics to examine adsorption from a molecular perspective. He is further interested in the metrology and measurement science of molecular simulations and adsorption. He is the current secretary treasurer of the International Adsorption Society. As in the previous segment, questions can be submitted via Zoom or as comments on YouTube. And those comments will be addressed at the end of Dr. Sidario's segment. Dan, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to those in Europe and uh, 
Good, very late evening to those of any viewers in, uh, in the Asia Pacific. I'd like to thank the organizers of the seminar for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk about NIST data resources for adsorption. Um, I'd like to point out to the, the co-authors of this work, uh, Vince Shen, Russ Johnson, and Roger Van Zee, who've all contributed to this uh, project at NIST. Let me first point out that I'm probably going to identify some commercially available items during this presentation, and that does not um, imply a recommendation by NIST, or, nor does it imply that it is the best available for the purposes described. And before going on, I should also acknowledge everyone that's contributed to this project in the past. Uh, this project is really indebted to the work of Alberto Marengo, who is a guest researcher at NIST for about three years. He wrote a lot of the code that drives the applications for the NIST isotherm database and our material registry. And uh, he provided a platform that allows us to grow in the future, even though he's not at NIST anymore. Much of the data that was gathered for this project was done uh, by high school interns, undergraduate students, and guest researchers. And we're also indebted to support from a data task force that guided the development of the NIST isotherm database, as well as fact lab personnel for their input in how uh, we were to catalog and enter the data into the database for accessibility. This project was originally funded by ARPA-E, uh, and since, uh, since that time, now it's become funded by the uh, regular funding of NIST. I'd also like to thank some external collaborators that have worked with me in the past year. Uh, Daniel Ungari and Leopold Talers from EPFL in Switzerland. Uh, they've, we've been working together in, in, uh, in coming up with vocabulary schemas and new applications for improving data exchange for adsorption. Now, as a quick background for NIST, uh, NIST is the US National Metrology Institute. Uh, you might know it as the National Bureau of Standards. And as a result, NIST is the main contact point between the SI system internationally and the United States. We're also responsible for the US National Reference Data System, which includes standard reference data and reference data products published by NIST. Our entire goal is to increase the competitiveness of US commerce by means of standards development and measurement science. You may know NIST uh, by our standard reference materials, which we have a kind of funny example that we like to show people of our standard reference peanut butter. Um, outside of the United States, you may know of these as certified reference materials. Others may know of NIST through reference data products like the NIST Chemistry Webbook, the RefProp software that is integrated with many adsorption instruments, or the thermoda Thermodata Engine for getting thermodynamics properties. And of course, the FACT Lab is now the main center for metrology and measurement science of adsorption in the United, in the United States. And as we saw in, in, in Yang's uh, previous presentation, we've generated two reference isotherms now that can be used for uh, laboratory calibration, but also then for broader purposes, including some papers where some simulations have been done to, to improve force field development. Today, I'm gonna kind of break my talk into two main segments. One, I wanna talk about NIST database resources for adsorption and give some brief overview in terms of the isotherm database, but also the registry of adsorbent materials and how to access this data using an application programming interface or API. Beyond that, then I wanna talk about some of the NIST tools that we have for adsorption data management. And this is more, how can NIST data tools help you with your adsorption data? And the three main package uh, sections I wanna talk about there are the NIST ISO, uh, the JSON isotherm format that we've developed at NIST, a data packaging and submission scheme, and then also how your manuscripts can develop, can, can um, benefit by integration with the NIST database products. So first, I wanna point out the main portal for NIST adsorption resources, which the, is the web address adsorption.nist.gov. Um, this is the data and informatics complement to the NIST Fact Lab. The idea is that we catalog isotherm measurements here. We have material characteristics cataloged. We provide an entire ecosystem for interacting with adsorption data through tools, analytics, and various APIs. The data sources for this, for this set of resources are first and foremost measurements from the fact lab, and you will be able to see the reference isotherms and all of the underlying support data for those isotherms shown in the database, but also adsorption measurements that are gathered from the extant scientific literature. And so this is done by harvesting data from papers that have been published in the past, but also by people that are publishing papers and supplying us with data directly. One of the main things that these database resources can do is to facilitate quick comparison or what you can call a virtual inter-laboratory study by comparing data on the fly. And so for an example, I, I go back to these kind of plots that have been around for a while, showing CO2 sorption by ZIF-8 and nitrogen sorption on uh, zeolite 5A. 
and showing how if you if you gather data from the literature, you can get some pretty big uh, trend differences in the, in in the stated isotherms. Uh, for ZIF8, of course, we have a cluster of three isotherms here shown that are very close together, but then one major outlier isotherm. Uh, for nitrogen uh, absorption by ZL85A, a much better cluster of isotherms, but even there, there's a, a, a large spread uh, at higher pressure. And there are underlying re reasons for this, but we'd also like our database resources to try to help us understand why these differences appear. Um, if we dig into the data, we'll find that like the CO2 absorption outlier is actually an absolute isotherm, whereas the others were excess isotherms. And that information was not clear in the published literature, but after digging down a little bit deeper, we were able to determine that. Uh, the absorption on zeolite 5 a on the other hand, is more a, a side effect of the differences in the material properties. Uh, for example, there's pelletization and, and binder effects, um, activation procedure. These all affect the measured isotherm. As of last week, um, our databases contain about 4,000 papers. We're getting close to 34,000 adsorption isotherms, of, of which nearly 2,000 are multi-component isotherms. We cover about 425 adsorbates and then over 7,000 adsorbent materials. Our ongoing plan for the databases is to add about 200 papers per year. Uh, that totals about 1,000 isotherms. And in the under the current operating uh, plans for the database, we're really focusing on multi-component isotherms. So many of you probably saw David Scholl's presentation on uh, binary adsorption isotherms about a month ago. Um, we're building on that and, and, and trying to show those, those isotherms uh, more prominently so that people can do separation experiments or planning, um, testing IAST, uh, various other applications. And we're also looking at liquid phase adsorption, although today I'm not going to talk about liquid phase adsorption. It requires a few, a little bit more um, uh, nuance in terms of how the data is described. And so now I want to go out and actually do some demonstrations of the kind of underlying isotherm database uh, through some uh, basic search capabilities and online isotherm comparison, and then also show how to interact with the API. So let's jump over to NIST database resources. This is adsorption.nist.gov, the first landing page that you find. And of course, we have blocks here for some of the main data products. The, the isotherm database, or as I call it, ISO, ISODB. We have a registry of adsorbent materials, which I'll talk about later, called MATDB, and then a link out to the fact lab. So let's go into the isotherm database and just kind of get a basic feel for how this, how this works out. The database is built around the idea that isotherms are associated with journal articles. And so when we do a search, for example, a reference material, let's look at RM8852, the paper that uh, Yang talked about earlier, we'll find that this points us to a paper and then it connects us to isotherms associated with that paper. And so this is the, the central kind of contact point is to look for papers that have certain adsorption isotherm data. Now we can clear this out and look at a more kind of general species. Let's look at a cooked up search I generated here on zeolite 5A. If we search for this, now we find more uh, article references all pointing to data from, in this case, this material that I've generated specifically for this search uh, demonstration. We can improve this search by looking at thermodynamic properties, by like limiting our temperature range, for example, if we want to limit it to data between 200 and 300 Kelvin. We can progressively search and limit our limit our results further, um, or we can go into bibli bibliographic data and limit the search according to author title, uh, the I'm sorry, authors or titles or journals. Now, these are all different options that have, allow us to search for adsorption data. So let's go back to my original search here on my zeolite 5A, and then we can link out to individual papers to access data and I even see a sample plot of an isotherm, or we can go back to the set of isotherms and create, in a sense, a virtual ILS study immediately in the web application. And so here I'm gonna plot out the, uh, let's, let's do uh, nitrogen at uh, 293. And so we can plot that isotherm and we can go into other papers and see if they have examples as well. There's a CO2 isotherm, we could, we could compare that, but that of course would not be a good comparison in this case. We can go in and get access to another nitrogen isotherm at 303 Kelvin, and now we're immediately getting comparison plots on the fly. So one more isotherm here. And in our plot panel, we're seeing these comparisons happen in, in real time. And so it's drawing from all of these different database sources that we have access to here. And we can turn these plots on, on and off by selecting them in the panel here. 
So this is the basic way that we can access adsorption isotherm data in the database. But it's not the only way to access data in the database. The other way to access, is, access, access this data is through the API. And so the API link on the database has some basic instructions on how to interact with this, with this uh, database through its API. There's a variety of different uh, database calls that allow us to look up records by bibliographic data, of course, going back to each individual article in the database, uh, looking at individual isotherms by calling up them, calling up the isotherm by file name, or generating a comprehensive list of the isotherms here, but I'm not going to call that an API call today. Uh, it would take about five minutes to run because of there's the content of 34,000 isotherms. We can also search by the adsorbate material or the adsorbate gas um, using different uh, ways to contact the API. But as an example here, I'll just show a quick example. And I've, I've cached these results so they're gonna run very quickly. Um, in, in real life, they would run a little bit slower uh, than what I'm gonna show you today. But if we were to ask for information using the basic API functionality here, there's an, there's an instruction to uh, search in this case by the gas species. You just have to give it an instruction to look for a particular species here. It's acetone in this case, and then do a search. And it will tell us the information about the adsorbate species that we have in the database. In this case, it's a kind of an expanded chemical information about acetone, the formula, the inchy key, the inchy code, different synonyms. This allows us to identify gases very, very comprehensively in the database. We can move on further and start looking at, uh, we, can, we can start looking at uh, materials or gases according to the bibliographic um, contents of the database. So for example, here, I'm gonna do a, a search for another one of the demo materials that I've, dem I've generated for this demonstration. Um, in this case, it's a ZIF-8 material. And by using a particular API call, we can access, in this case, all of the article records that we have in the database that point to this demo ZIF-8 material that we've generated. And by looking at the payload, uh, data that's actually delivered, we can actually get access to the individual isotherms associated with uh, the different articles that are referenced for this case. As a more realistic example here, one thing we can do is look at all of the isotherms that are associated with the uh, methane reference isotherm that was generated by, by the fact lab. And so by asking for the bibliographic information about the paper associated with that data and um, this is just given by the, the DOI for the paper here. We can ac access the entire list of isotherms in our database that's associated with that paper. And here it turns out to be uh, this number of, of isotherms up here. And of course, since we're working in an API environment, now we have access to all the data numerically. And just by unwrapping the isotherms, we can even generate graphics that are very similar to what's published in the paper um, that, that was shown by Yang earlier. And so here, as an example, I've plotted all of the isotherms from aliquot one uh, of, of, the, of the reference isotherm, um, including the outlier sets, and then also have plotted the reference isotherm that's available in the database. So the entire point behind this is to show how you can access the database, the database and the data inside it very easily using the API functions. And it's a very straightforward API to work with. Um, you just have to learn a couple of basic calls. And then from there, you're able to build a very comprehensive analytic solution uh, to look at data, database con the database contents quickly. Now, because many people want to do data mining on our database, uh, I would like to point out one additional new resource that has never existed before. Uh, one is that, uh, that being that we have a GitHub mirror of the entire API. Um, the entire API can be scraped from our server, um, but I will tell you that it takes about two hours to scrape all the isotherms. Um, on the recommendation of some, some end users, we put the entire database contents inside of a GitHub repository. And sorry, the Zoom bar is preventing me from accessing it here. Pardon me for just a moment. Okay. So the entire database API can be, can be downloaded by cloning this GitHub repository. And the most more important part about this, this repository as well is that the commit log for the repository shows all of the changes that have been made to the database kind of on a day, to, on a day by day basis. So anytime that the API up, up is updated because of database contents have been changed or there's been a correction applied uh, or there's been new data, new data uploaded, the, the git commit log will reflect that and you can see exactly where all the changes were. Uh, and, the, and the other side, 
the other important side of this is that uh, this entire repository can be cloned in about five minutes. Um, just put in a, a standard uh, git, git clone command and the entire contents will download to your computer to use. And then you don't have to worry about scraping the database one isotherm at a time. So let's go back to the database and talk about another um, aspect of this work. One thing that we ran into when developing the NIST database products uh, was that how do we uniquely identify an adsorbent material? Uh, because adsorbents are not like standard chemicals in the, in, the, in the sense that they can be described by INCHI, which is a graph-based method of, of describing molecules. Uh, SMILES works for some materials. I'd like to point out a paper by uh, Randy Snur's group by Ben Boussier, where they developed MOF ID or MOF key based on, the, uh, on a SMILES description of, of MOFs. Um, it could be linked to a CAS number, but even CAS numbers are not, are not necessarily useful for newly synthesized materials. Uh, you can use IAPAC naming schemes to describe materials. But the problem is that all of these systems don't really work comprehensively. There's some major pitfalls associated with uniquely identifying adsorbent materials. Uh, the first is that some materials really evade unambiguous definition, and the, the material I'm calling out here is activated carbons. Um, there's so many different varieties of activated carbon, um, and furthermore, it's not really a chemical species in that regard. It's not one type of, of material. Um, you have all of the counter ions, there's um, ash, there's different everything else that goes along with an activated carbon. So it's very difficult to describe that with some sort of systematic method. Um, the easiest way to identify a, car a carbon material is just to point it to a uh, point yourself point yourself to a manufacturer. Other pitfalls associated with identifying adsorbent materials include the fact that material history is relevant to adsorption characteristics. Uh, Yang pointed out how the activation procedure was very critical for being able to reproduce the reference isotherm. So material history matters. Also, we've had a lot of composite materials that have been developed uh, in recent years. And so we have a MOF combined with a zeolite or a MOF combined with a carbon material. Um, this is not really suitable for a systematic or algorithmic approach to describing a material. We also have issues with preparation, like a pelletization or, or binder effects. Um, there's inconsistent naming schemes. Um, the, the one that I like to point out to people because it probably drives lots of undergraduates crazy is the copper BTC material. Um, originally it was called HCOST1. Um, I, I see it more as copper BTC today. Um, but if you look in, in the Sigma Aldrich catalog, it's basolite C300. And then years later, someone pointed out to me that it was also called MOF199. Um, so how do we keep track of all of these different names and make it easy for everyone to identify this adsorbent material from all of these different names. Uh, the last pitfall that I'll point out to today is that sometimes a material is defined solely by a synthesis. Um, you'll read a paper and a, and a new MOF compound will just be called compound one. Well, that's not very helpful for identifying that material in a systematic way. So the way that we have gotten around this is by developing a NIST registry of adsorbent materials. Um, we've not tried to come up with a single system for describing materials. What we basically have done is, is develop a cross-referencing system, cross system so that a material can be identified through all of the other subsidiary references that it might have. Um, so we start with what we call a NIST adsorbent identifier or colloquially known as the hash key because it's based on a cryptographic hash. It's associated with at least a name, whether it's conventional, commercial, or an IUPAC name. And then it could also be associated with chemistry, like a unit cell formula. Uh, we can identify it with relevant articles, like a synthesis article or a characterization article, and then other external resources, such as the International Zeolite Association's uh, database. Uh, uh, there's the MOF omics or the ZOMX databases, uh, spec sheets, systematic identifiers, like the MOF ID or MOF key. But the most important thing is that these are all linked back to a single identifier within NIST's registry. So let's go over to that uh, registry here and see what we can what we can see. So the, the NIST registry or the MATDB, it's just a way of basically getting at that hash key identifier or that NIST adsorbent identifier easily. And so to search out for like copper BTC, we can search for that and then look at the material and we see the registry ID or the NIST adsorbent identifier. And we see a list of synonyms that it's associated with. Um, we do not have the unit cell entered in this case. And then we have link outs to different resources associated with this material. Um, and so, for example, like we link out to the Cambridge Structural Database, and then you can see it identified by its uh, CSD rough code. Uh, so FIXN in this case, FIQCEN. 
identifying copper BTC. The other side of the NIST registry of absorbent materials is that we allow, we have a, a user feedback mechanism. And so for example, this copper BTC, using the user feedback mechanism, you could revise this material or propose a revision to this material by entering, in this case, maybe the unit cell formula or adding more synonyms or adding other external resources like linking it to an original synthesis paper or a characterization paper. Um, we try to be very broad in what we allow to be captured here uh, because we're not trying to come up with a single system that's identifying every single absorbent material. We're trying to link back to different systems, different synthesis uh, descriptions so that it's easier for people to understand what the material is. If this feedback is submitted, uh, it goes and gets submitted uh, to, a, to a feedback management system at NIST, and then the NIST technical staff take a look and make a decision whether we're going to accept this revision. One other thing that can be done within this registry is to use a, um, the proposal mechanism where a material can be uh, proposed for the registry. So for example, this, I was just looking up a paper by Omar Yagi, which they've developed a new uh, cough material. And if you read through the paper, you can find information about its IUPAC name, um, its colloquial name of cough 790. There's a unit cell formula. Um, going and looking at the Cambridge Structural Database, I was able to find a CSD ref code and a, CS, a CCID or a CCDC identifier. And so then we could actually generate a proposal for registering this material in the NIST, in the NIST registry. And so I've already pre-filled the form here to show how this can be added in. We could add in other external resources, like if there was another paper that we wanted to link to uh, with, a, with a DOI. Uh, these could all be linked, linked in together and then submitted for review by NIST. And then it would end up in the, it would, if it was approved, it would end up in the NIST registry of absorbent materials. And now you have a unique identifier for a absorbent material that can be used to identify isotherms or link to isotherms in the future. Now, that was an overview of both the isotherm database and the NIST registry of absorbent materials. What I want to talk about now is basically how to put some of these data resources to use for uh, by you as an end user. And, and a lot of that has to do with getting data into a way that can be used by other individuals or even putting your data, data into the NIST database. Um, and so the first thing I want to talk about is how to encode a, a, an adsorption isotherm. And so what I want to talk about here is the NIST JSON isotherm format. And I'm going to show you a binary example or a binary adsorption example because it shows why the JSON format is a little bit more complicated than one might expect. Um, the idea being here that an adsorption isotherm is described in very unambiguous terms uh, by using a NIST JSON isotherm format. Uh, it eliminates confusion and it encodes all of the thermodynamic information that we're really looking for in an adsorption isotherm. So, I want to build. I want to. I want to use an example from a paper by Shivaji uh, Sirkar uh, from over a decade ago, in which they had some uh, O2 N2 adsorption data published. Here is a, a an isotherm plot showing the the excess adsorption on the y-axis as a function of the um, mole fraction of nitrogen at three different temperatures, and we're going to look at the zero Celsius or the 273 Kelvin isotherm here. And so then the question is, what, how do we really completely describe this isotherm without any ambiguity? Um, and so the way that I think about it as a thermodynamicist is I first start thinking about the measurement. Of course, this is a, just an example of a binary instrument, uh, a rubytherm uh, binary adsorption instrument with a gravimetric balance and a, and, and a magnetic suspension balance. But the, the, the thing is that this is a very complicated schematic. It doesn't really tell me enough about how to encode this data. And so thinking back to thermodynamics, what I really see is that we have, we have to describe the equilibrium between a bulk phase and an adsorbed phase. And if you start thinking about like what an adsorption experiment is actually doing, we, we know something about a bulk gas phase, like the adsorptive species that are there. We know an adsorbent material and an amount for, for that. Chemical thermal and mechanical equilibrium is established. And then we make measurements on the, bulk, the pressure of the bulk phase, the composition of the bulk phase, we measure the adsorbed masses, like, like Yang talked about earlier. And for me as a thermodynamicist too, I know that the amount of information that I really need to describe this equilibrium is governed by the Gibbs phase rule. And so I need to know something about the number of, of comp components here, the number of phases. Uh, and of course I have a subtraction of two, which, is, which, which um, limits the number of degrees of freedom that I have in the problem. And so what it really comes down to is if I know the temperature, the pressure, 
the composition of a bulk gas phase and then the adsorbed masses of the adsorbed phase, I've completely described this problem. And so the NIST isotherm format or the JSON format is really intended to take this information that we need for thermodynamics and encode it in a way that a computer can read, but also a human can read very easily. So the 273 Kelvin isotherm here that's plotted on, on the, the, the highest adsorption values in this, in this figure um, can really be boiled down to this information here. We know that we're dealing with a mordenite material. It's an experimental measurement, the temperature is 273. And looking at the x-axis, we have the mole fraction of nitrogen going from zero to one. Of course, the oxygen mole fraction is just gonna be one minus that because it's, binary, uh, it's a binary uh, experiment. The pressure is fixed in this case at one bar. And then there are adsorption measurements given for both the nitrogen and the oxygen species. And so we need to take this table and then put it in a way that a computer can read. The solution to that that we, that we developed is the NIST isotherm JSON file. And so I've simplified this a little bit so that we can first of all, squeeze it on one screen, but also um, make it very easy to show what this, is, what this is telling us. So the NIST JSON isotherm file, first of all, tells us about the adsorbent material, um, the mordenite in this case, and linking it as again to the NIST adsorbent identifier or the hash key, tells us about the adsorbates that are present in the, in the bulk phase, the nitrogen and oxygen in this case. We have some metadata about the measurement type. In this case, it's an experiment, the temperature 273 Kelvin. Um, metadata like, was this information taken from a data table or was it taken from a, uh, a graphic? In this case, this graphic was digitized using a, a tool called Webplot Digitizer. And so we do not mark this as a true tabular data set. Other metadata that's important is the, the units of the measurements. So we have pressure as being um, in bar units, adsorption is given in millimoles per gram. Uh, and the composition of the bulk phase is described in terms of mole fractions. And then we have a sequence of, of, of data points encapsulated in this JSON file in which each point can kind of be viewed as an individual experiment. So all of the Gibbs phase rule information that's necessary is contained within each of these uh, JSON objects in, inside of this array. And so for each point, we have, of course, the pressure stated. And then for all of the species involved, we have the composition and then the adsorption, composition being the composition in the bulk phase, the adsorption being the adsorbed mass in the adsorbed phase. And then we use inchi key in this case to connect these measurements back to one of the species. Um, and of course, this in, in this case, if we just look up to the top, we can see that that's the nitrogen measurement. This MYM um, inchi key is of course pointing to oxygen. And then each point along the isotherm, these uh, five points are shown as individual JSON objects in this file. So then this is how the NIST database contains the data, but it also is a way to get the data out and to plot it. And so, for example, we can go over to the uh, NIST isotherm database and let's look this up by the, uh, excuse me, um, by, the, uh, by the author. And we can find, let's see, where are we at here? It's this paper right here. We can plot the isotherm, switch over to composition x-axis and see the data plotted here. And so that's the exact same figure that I've drawn uh, on, this, on the slide in PowerPoint here. So the idea is that the JSON file that we that we've shown here is an unambiguous description of what's happening in the, in, in the experiment. We've not lost any information. We know what all of these measurements mean uh, because of the metadata that's being carried around in the JSON file. Okay. Now, one challenge I, I, I can see here is that it's easy to generate a data table, in this case, like on a spreadsheet, but putting it into that JSON format is a little more complicated. Um, it's, it would be easy to make typos. And so I've worked with some people at EPFL in Switzerland to generate a tool for converting data like this tabular data into the JSON format for, for uh, in, uh, ingestion into the NIST database. And so, and this is available at digitizer.matscreen.com. Um, and let's go actually over and use that here. So this is the live hosted application. And basically what the intention behind this is, is to provide a form that, that a user can use to enter all of the data about an isotherm and then generate that, that JSON file without making any mistakes. And so I actually wanna do this in uh, live here. And so we're gonna to go to the multi-component tab and start filling out this form by copying data over 
that I uh, pre-tabulated. These drop-down menus that are auto-filling are generated from the NIST uh, database API. And so anytime you see an update to like our list of adsorbates or adsorbents, uh, this application will update itself automatically. So we need nitrogen and oxygen. We'll try to fill out this form as, as completely as possible to, to eliminate ambiguity. And then lastly, all we have to do is drop in the data table. And then check the isotherm. Now, of course, this is not showing the composition on the x-axis, so we're missing a little bit of data there, but then we can download the JSON isotherm file and even view it right now. And so this is the output from this tool called the, uh, from the digitization panel, as we call it. And so you can see here that this is very similar to the JSON file that was shown in the PowerPoint slides. We see the same type of structure in terms of the adsorbates and the adsorbent, the same metadata being carried around, and then the individual data points from the isotherm all contained in a, in a way that is computer readable and human readable. The NIST JSON file is a verbose file in the sense that it seems like it takes a lot of lines of data to be able to describe an entire isotherm. But the idea here is to, to, to reduce ambiguity, and we do that at the cost of, of, of verbosity. Some people may ask how this relates to the adsorption information file that's been proposed by uh, Stefan Kaskel's group. Uh, Jack Evans developed it, and the paper describing the AIF came out in Langmuir last week. Um, AIF is completely compatible with the NIST JSON isotherm format. Um, there can be a loss of some met metadata going back and forth between AIF and, and JSON, uh, but we're actually gonna, we're working on, uh, on making the vocabulary uniform between the two formats so that there will be less loss of information. We don't view these two formats as being competitors. It's more a case of the AIF fits one niche in terms of describing data that's coming out of instruments, whereas the JSON file is more suited to uh, gathering data from literature uh, papers, but also then outputting data in an API uh, that's readable by normal parsers, uh, because almost every software package out there has a JSON parser built in. And so you just point your software toward the API and, and it will read in the data as a dictionary for, uh, for use elsewhere. All right. Now, NIST would like to participate with adsorption scientists in terms of holding on to your data or publishing it for you. So many groups throughout the world are now trying to deal with data management plans. Uh, at least in the United States, the National Science Foundation is requiring release of data and having a plan for how that data is going to be managed for any data, for any experiments that are, 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 are done with funding from, uh, from the NSF. And so NIST ISO DB can actually be one of the places for depositing data to be a part of your data management plan. So we're allowing submission of data to this database. Basically, when a paper has been published, because we, all of our data are centered around a publication, um, and after peer review, uh, we can accept data from your paper. The easiest way to do that is to take data from your paper, convert it into JSON files using the matte screen digitizer application, and then send the compressed JSON files to isotherm at nist.gov. After that, NIST will handle the rest. All the bibliographic information is generated from the DOIs associated with the paper, and, um, and we will do all of the, the, in a sense, the metadata correction or the meta metadata uniformization so that the, the uh, JSON files can be uploaded into, into our database and then accessed very easily afterward. Um, some tips for, for end users. One is anytime that you're describing an isotherm in the paper, reduce ambiguity. Um, state whether it's an excess or an absolute isotherm. Um, state your units very clearly. Um, Basically, just reduce the, the confusion that can happen by trying to read, an iso, read the description of an isotherm from five different spots in a paper. Put it all in one place. Second, I suggest that all authors use an author identifier like ORC ID or researcher ID. Um, the DOI payloads for, uh, that we uh -huh. use to generate the bibliographic information for our database can accept ORC ID or researcher ID, and then it makes it easier to connect you to your data. Lastly, 
Um, if you coordinate this work with us before your paper is published, you can even include a data citation uh, link in your paper. We have an API as part of the database in which it, and a DOI can be entered, and then the data associated with that article will be shown on screen. So that's a one way where you can make it very easy to cite the, the, the data for, your, for your, your papers using the NIST ISO-DP in a way that is uh, go going to be managed and uh, preserved for the future. Lastly, I'll, I'll point out that uh, we're developing a better workflow for data submission. Um, eventually, we're going to have a GitHub-based repository in which data can be submitted by pull request. And uh, but we have to put some other tools in place before this is going to be completely ready. So watch the uh, NIST uh, ISODB newsfeed to see when this is available. To wrap up, um, I wanted to talk today just a little bit about how to use the NIST uh, adsorption database resources. And our intent is really to provide descriptive data and data solutions for all of our users, whether it's getting data from other sources through our databases or providing tools for you to submit your data or to use it on, on your end. Things we did not cover today, um, because just because of lack of time, were liquid phase adsorption and how to encode that in a JSON file. We've actually worked that out, um, but it does require a little bit of, of, of nuance in, how the, in terms of how the data is, is put into the JSON file. We also have a number of tools on the, on the ISODB website. Uh, for, for one, there's an IAST uh, widget to, uh, to do prediction of uh, multi-component isotherms using database uh, isotherms. We also have an adsorption column simulator, which was built with assistance from uh, the, the VU in, in Brussels from uh, like Yuri Denier's group and uh, Gino Barron's former students. Um, they helped us develop a, a column simulator in which isotherms from the NIST database uh, can be entered directly in to simulate breakthrough or, or different dynamics in a column. Things we're looking at for the future. Uh, first of all, we need to develop a vocabulary for adsorption isotherms or what, what one may, may call a schema. The idea here is that the NIST JSON isotherm file would not be the only solution to publishing data for adsorption isotherms. The alternative would be the adsorption information file that, that uh, has been proposed by Stefan Kaskel's group. But at the same time, the use of a vocabulary of adsorption isotherms would improve data interoperability between these two different solutions and then allow for exchange between the two formats without any loss of information. We're also looking at embellishing our API output by using what's called JSON-LD or linked data. Uh, the idea here is to add, context, add additional context to the JSON isotherm files to facilitate data mining uh, or other data reuse. For any of these things, I suggest that you keep an eye on the news feed on adsorption.nist.gov. It's also available as an RSS feed. Um, if you want to add it to one of your uh, um, newsfeed readers. As far as the future of the adsorption information file goes, I'd recommend that people take a look at the online tutorial by Jack Evans. That's going to be this Friday at the exact same time as this, as this seminar. Um, the registration link is available in Stefan Kaskel's uh, Twitter feed. So just take a look at at Kaskel, and then you can find the link to register for their, uh, for their webinar. For some uh, further reading, I'll point you to some papers that have used NIST database resources in the past. Uh, for example, there's a couple of papers out of uh, David Scholl's group in which they've done some meta-analysis of our isotherm database uh, to address reproducibility, and then also generating uh, lists of, uh, of, of verified isotherms for different types of materials and adsorbates. Uh, Paul Yakimi, a former student of, uh, of Philip Llewellyn, uh, published a paper on, on uh, different analytics tools for looking at isotherm, isotherms. Uh, he built a lot of the data structures on top of the NIST JSON isotherm format, although he developed it far beyond our intentions uh, in terms of being able to describe adsorption hysteresis, carrying along calorimetric data. Um, and then he also did some data, data mining by looking for um, binary uh, separations. The paper by Jack Evans that was published in Langmuir is listed there, the Universal Standard Archive File for Adsorption Data. And if you're interested in how to identify MOFs, uh, ben Boussier's paper uh, from 2019 on developing the MOF ID or the MOF key is, is listed at the bottom. And at that, uh, I'd like to take some questions and allow some discussion if, if time allows. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. We have a, one question. Is the database available for free or do we have to subscribe? 
The database is completely free. Um, there are no charges available. There's no registration required. Um, if people submit feedback to the database, we collect information about your name and your email address, but that's just simply to facilitate communication with end users. So it's a completely free data, pro data product. Okay. Um, Professor Renders new say, thanks for putting together these useful tools for the adsorption community. Does ISODB accept, accept data from molecular simulation? Yes, we do. Um, so all of the data that I showed today was experiment-based. Um, and I did not dwell on this point when I was showing like the JSON, um, the, the mat screen digitizer tool. We can select and describe the data as molecular simulation. And so we're, we very, we're very happy to accept molecular simulation data as well. It'll be tagged as such, um, but that is to help um, anyone who's mining us to see uh, so that they can clearly identify experimental data from uh, simulation data. In addition to that, we also will sometimes accept data based built from models, um, even DFT or like a, a fluid DFT isotherms. And so we're, we're very much a, a big tent in this. We don't want to limit it just to experiment. But at the same time, we do describe the data so that it's clear what it means. And I see a question here on uh, YouTube. Uh, is there any limit to the isotherm temperatures that, that you catalog? Um, no, that's just a, in a sense, a, an integer field in the database. And so we can accept any re reasonable or rational uh, temperature. Um, the scripts that I use to clean up data um, will make will, will check those numbers, but it's not that it rejects the data automatically. It's more a case of like, if temperatures are extremely high or extremely low, then I kick that data over for further review. Um, but, if it's, but if it's based on solid experimental procedures, then we're not going to have any problem accepting any temperature. Um, Dan, maybe I will ask a question. There is no way that I can input the question here. Um, so does the NIST database allow um, metadata such as um, whether it comes from crystals or from particles and if there is any information about the binders? Because if uh, in your answer to Randy, if we were now to compare experimental with uh, simulation data, this becomes very critical. Um, so the, the NIST database does not carry along that type of metadata yet. Um, this is a feature request that I've had from a number of end users. And so I think that when we have the resources to expand what the database is carrying along, uh, we would add an option to include this type of metadata in, 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 the, uh, in the isotherm files. Um, I should have included an, another reference on the further reading, reading tab. Um, there's going to be a paper coming out of Randy Snur's group soon about their MoffDB um, database that contains isotherms uh, for there's generated from simulations. Um, and in their data format, which is developed from the NIST JSON isotherm format, they do include all of this extra information about the, the MOF characteristics, like linking it to a CIF file uh, or this, the Cambridge Structural Database. They include that extra information. Um, we had to develop a data format that we could capture or that could work with almost all data sets. And this extra metadata is not always supplied in a paper. And so we, we, we didn't make that a priority early on. In the future, I think it should be very important to include all of this extra metadata like skeletal density, uh, sample sizes, um, material handling, handling procedures. And the good part about the NIST JSON format is that it does allow this flexibility uh, because it's basically a dictionary. And all you have to do is define extra keys where this met metadata can be carried along or even just have a key that's a long string. And that string could contain all of this extra metadata that, that people are interested in. Um, again, I, I will throw in another question. So um, is there any plan to extend this to also include kinetic information? At present, no. Um, kinetics is, a, I think it's an important um, aspect of absorption, especially as a chemical engineer in terms of applications. Uh, but that's not uh, a priority area for us right now. Maybe I have a question for uh, Yang. Um, Yang, is there also any um, proposal to look at a standard a binary or, or multi-component uh, isotherms as well in the future? You mentioned water, yes. but what about um, binaries? 
we are working on multi-component um, in our lab right now, but I don't think we're ready for um, an lab study yet, but there will be multi-component in the future. Okay, excellent. I don't think we have any other questions, so I will just uh, wrap this up. So, uh, uh, let me conclude by thanking uh, Yang and Dan for their presentations. We also thank all our attendees for joining this webinar and hope it was both educational and enjoyable. An edited version of this webinar will be posted on the IAS YouTube channel. Uh, the, the hope is that the work discussed today will be a very useful resource for the adoption community in the future. Um, the next IAS uh, webinar uh, will be uh, is tentatively scheduled for 21st of May and it will be presented by Professor Konchi Anya, and the topic is provided here. More updates will follow uh, through regular IAS uh, channels. So we wish you a wonderful week ahead, and uh, thank you so much for attending. Take care. Bye-bye.